Okay. My name is Chmeri Anazia, pronouns she, her, hers. Okay. Well, good morning. Good morning. So I'm going to begin with a few questions just so that you can tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, so let's start with where are you from? Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I was born in upstate New York, Poughkeepsie, but we moved down here when I was three years old. So really I'm from NC. Okay. So describe your experiences growing up in Raleigh. What do you remember about your neighborhood, your experiences in school? Just, just a little brief synopsis. Okay. Um, I came from a, I come from a predominantly black neighborhood, like the neighborhood that I live in, uh, where my parents start, that's the neighborhood I basically grew up in since I was three. I know we lived in like an apartment complex before that, but I don't remember much. Um, so yeah, predominantly black neighborhood, had a lot of like majority black neighborhood friends that I still keep in touch with today. And then in school, I grew up, or I went to a lot of diverse schools, like I can't remember what my well, my preschool was, um, it was a black Christian type of school. It was called Word of God, but I went there for like pre-K. Mm -hmm. So I don't really remember much. And then for kindergarten through second grade, I went to a charter school that was literally right across from my neighborhood. It was called pre Intimate Charter School. And that was a majority black school. Um, and like, I enjoyed it because I made a lot of friends. Even some of the people that I met there, I kind of still remember till today, like this one friend I have, um, he noticed me on campus. He was like, yeah, we were in the same second grade class. I was like, oh, yeah. But um, majority of that was a good experience. Um, and then I don't know what, was the reason, what the reason was, but then my parents had me go to a public school, um, a Creech Road Elementary School in Garner, North Carolina. And that school was mainly, it was very diverse, as I can remember. Um, so I got there in third grade, so I was very nervous. But like my teacher, she was really great. And then um, I remember the first friend I made, she was Hispanic. And like, um, she just came up to me and was like, hey, can you be my friend? I was like, yeah, sure. But then I realized she wanted me to be her friend because she was trying to get back at her other friend. But that was so fine because like, we, that's how we became friends. And um, I still, I know her till today. Like we have her on, I have her on social media and stuff. Um, but yeah, elementary school, um, third grade to fifth grade was very diverse. I had like black friends, white friends, Hispanic friends. Um, and also just, I remember um, I te my teachers would always talk about like MLK Day and um, just a lot of black history stuff. Um, I remember when I was at pre um, we were gonna have like this MLK, I remember it was like, they were gonna be doing a speech and I was so excited for it, but I didn't even end up going because I had hurt my foot or I was sick or something, so I didn't end up going, but I remember my school was gonna do that for us. And then um, I used to remember in like, in elementary school, we would always watch that, um, like the MLK kid movie, where it's like, it's animated and it's like the kids that, they're like in the present, but then they go back to when Martin Luther King was alive and they experienced how life was back then. I remember watching that growing up and I just could never understand like why black and white kids just couldn't be friends and like, how they had to be separated. It just didn't make sense to me as a kid growing up. And then um, I remember, and I think it was fourth grade, we had like um, a wax museum type thing where it's like we, um, we were like civil rights activists and people. So I was, I remember I was Rosa Parks and like, um, I remember it was really cool just um, being her, like pretend, well, pretend to be her really, but like, it was like we gave her, like gave like a, historical background of who they were and we I think we had like a report on it so that was really fun and then um I remember I don't know where I got this book from but it was a Rosa Parks book and like I had it since I was in elementary school and I still have it till today it's just tucked away in my little um places that I keep old stuff and it's just like she just really um inspired me as a kid like she could do that like she just didn't want to give up her seat and I was like wow that's really awesome so I I looked up to her a lot when I was growing up um, and then, so that was elementary school and middle school, um, was also very diverse. I went to Garner Magnet High School and a lot of the friends I had in middle school, we also went to the same high school. So I still keep in touch with them till today, till today. 
um, ninth grade through like 10th grade was a pretty good, it was a pretty good time. Um, I do remember this one instance where a teacher was telling us about like um, racism and stuff and he had mentioned that he's colorblind, colorblind. So at the time I was like, oh, colorblindness, that's a good thing. Like it's good not to see color. And I think um, at the time I was like, yeah, that's good. But then now I, now I realize like it's important to see color and like to see people for who they are and not like we're all the same because we're not. We all have different experiences and like what we've grown up with. So I understand like what he was trying to convey, but it's still important to like see color and stuff. And um, I don't remember what well, we did. We always like have typical like um, Black History Month stuff, but I don't really remember a lot of it that we did in high school. And then also when I was um, junior, my junior and senior year of high school, I was in a program called the International Baccalaureate Program, IB. It's like a global program where we learn about um, not just like the typical AP world history stuff, we learn about like cultures around the world. So that class was really awesome because I was exposed to like a lot of different like religions and just different worldly conflicts that happen that they usually don't teach us in high school. So that was a great experience just being exposed to that. Um, but I was in like, um, the program itself, like my high school was very diverse, but the program I was in was very not diverse. It was very white, like a majority, yeah, majority was white. Um, there was like a couple of like people of color, not, not a lot. So like that being in that setting wasn't really, a diverse, but I still had a lot of good friends in it, or just the people that were the same sin, same skin color as me. I connected with, and I still keep in contact with them till today. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's that's been like my. But then also, I remember just growing up, people always would tell me like I sound white. And I was like, is that a good thing? Because like, as a kid, I was like, I think that's good. Like it's good to sound proper. But now I'm just like, no, that's like not a good way to tell somebody that and then it just paste the image of like we have to meet the whiteness standard but I don't know I just grew up in an environment that this is just how I came out to talk and it's not really a white it's just like this is just how I speak and I learned now that that's just like a passive form of racism that I didn't really know about growing up when I learned about a lot of stuff that's just going on in this time period I've been getting a lot of education about just a lot of different things um so yeah yeah okay good so um what you're kind of touching on in talking about your experiences is how you became aware of um the racial climate and um microaggressions and so on so do you remember a specific incident that made you aware of racism hmm. I can't like remember because I feel like it's just like something I just come to know and I've never been myself been like attacked because of my skin color personally um but I guess just in elementary school like just learning about how before we were here there was a time when black and white kids weren't black people weren't treated fairly for their skin color and like the whites only signs and stuff like that so just learning about that as a kid, I was just like, I wonder why things were like that. But like, now I'm just like, well, things are different, but they're still not good. Um, yeah. Did you talk about racism in your household? Were there um, adults maybe that gave you some guidance? Um, my parents, we don't know, they don't really talk about racism because my parents are from Nigeria. So um, I'm like a first generation American or African-American here. So, well, in Nigeria, it's like, everybody's like the same skin color mostly. So it's like, they grew up not really around racism or anything, because everybody looked the same. Um, my dad came here in like the 80s, um, 87, and he went to a school in Texas. And then my mom came later in like the early 90s. So we don't really talk about racism a lot, but I know 
sometimes um, when there's stuff going on like on TV, like with um, unarmed black men and women and brown people getting gunned down for nothing. We talk about that, like it's like sad to see, but like they never really sat down with me and talked to me about racism. Really school just did that for me. Um, yeah, it's just like, I don't know, just like in African households, they don't really talk about racism a lot. They talk about like other things or stuff that's happening like in Nigeria and stuff. Um, but yeah, so I just had to hear it on my own. Yeah, like politics. <clears throat> Is that a topic of discussion? Politics, man? Yeah. <laughs> I like to talk about Nigerian politics, American politics, just everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so you told me that you attended protests. So let's talk a bit more about those protests. What was the first protest that you attended and what has inspired you to attend that protest? Um, the first protest I attended was, it was in it June, it was June. I can't remember, I remember it was on a Saturday. It was the first protest since um, the George Floyd killing that, um, that happened in Greensboro. It was on a Saturday. And at first, um, I wanted to go to this other protest that one of my friends that was going to lead, and I was spreading the word about it, but then people um, started to, like, question it because my friend was white, and I didn't understand, like, why people were, like, being mad at her for trying to start a protest, and, like, because we, I've been waiting to see if anybody would start one, but then nobody was, so I thought it was good that she took the initiative, but then I realized now that it's because of just a white person leading a, like a black movement and so now I get why people were mad about it but then they started calling her like a white supremacist and like mm -hmm. all these things and that just didn't I didn't like that because I know her and she's not like that she wants to go into like social work and help people and help people so she was really um she got really sad about that but I know she got past it and like she still supports the movement it's just like she just stays in the back and not in the front um, so I was going to go to that, and then somehow my mom found out, because my mom doesn't like me attending protests because of everything that's just been going on. Like, she was like, I remember she called me, I'm like, oh, crap, she found out. And she was like, you see what they did on TV to, like, the reporters, see how they treat them? I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I know, I'll, I'll be safe. But she's like, no, I'm like, okay. So then I was, one, on Saturday, I wanted to donate blood that day, but my iron was too low, so I'm like, well, what am I gonna do now? So then I um I was on Facebook last night and I saw the dude um free free dope major AJ was um gonna have a protest the next day at front of the civil rights museum in downtown. So I was like, okay, I'll just go to that and see like what's it gonna be like. Um and I went by myself because all my friends were busy. So I was like, I'll just stop by to see. So I got there and it was like pretty empty. It wasn't like a lot of people, just a couple of people standing around. So I kind of just did a little bit in the back, just like I didn't know um, what was going to happen. We were just, people were just um, chatting and talking. So then um, the AJ, he arrived, and then that's when it really got started. And like, I was kind of very just anxiously excited because I was like, I'm excited because this is like my first, um, like a Black Lives Matter protest that I've been to. But then I was just anxious just about all the things I've seen on TV. Um, so then um, I remember we just, started like chanting and then we went to the streets and I was like oh whoa we're going to the streets like there's cars so I was nervous about that but it was just like when everybody got together it just felt very powerful and then um, we walked a lot around downtown and also the police was there but the police were mainly um, blocking off traffic and like escort escorting us through downtown so that experience with the police was a good one and the fact that they um, escorted us and they didn't like tell us to get off the streets or like pepper spray us or anything and we just walked around a lot I remember it was a lot of walking and then as we were walking more people and more people started to come until it was like a really big protest and um, I remember I was also very nervous going to protest since like we were in a pandemic and COVID and stuff so while I was there I made sure I had my mask on and I stayed away from people I didn't want to really be around too many people and I had hand sanitizer so I felt safe in that sense, um, just because the majority of a lot of people were wearing masks, so that made me feel a lot better. Um, so it was a really good, it was a really good protest. Um, we took a lot of time to just stop and chant or just sit and just occupy the space. So like I remember we were, like we went into the intersection of like Westgate and we kind of just stood there for a minute, took a break and like 
um, people would talk and use the megaphone and stuff. So it was really awesome and just getting educated in that moment and like how these things go. And then um, as we were walking down Westgate, uh, I remember I was, cause I lived like right off of Westgate. So I um, texted my friend, I was like, hey, come join us. We're on Westgate, we're about to pass the house. So she was able to come out. That was really nice that I had at least one of my friends that I knew with me walking. You know, cause I tend to go th to these things alone cause not many people I know like to attend protests. So it was nice having my roommate with me. So we were walking, we, in total, we walked for about eight hours, I think. So I got like 30,000 steps that day and it was crazy. Mm -hmm. So I remember um, we were walking down Westgate and the police would still escort us and like they weren't really getting um, handsy with anybody. Uh, and then like a lot of cars would just honk and support. Like I thought cars would be really pissed, but people were like really happy to see it. Cause I think it, that was the first major one that happened in Greensboro um, after George Floyd was killed. So then we started walking towards like the highway, like I forward. I was like, oh, I don't know about this. Cause like, I was like, are we allowed to like walk on the highway? So I was just like, I don't know. And then people were talking about like, you can't do that. They might come and arrest us. So my roommate and I were just like, well, let's just, well, we, everybody's going, might as well just go. So we were walking and then that's when like the police on their bicycles, they're just pedaling super hard. They ride their little bicycles and they pedal everywhere. And um they just came all of a sudden out of nowhere and then they were able to like walk off the highway as we were coming on and then um I remember we were just standing in the grass and then this one dude just really ran like on the highway as cars were still passing by so I was just like this is crazy I shouldn't be here my mom is gonna find out because of course people had like cameras and phones I'm like ah so but yeah that was that was really crazy because I've never done something like that and we just also occupied the highway to just show like this is important you guys must stop and watch what we're doing because like this is very important in this matter so that was really awesome to just be able to do that and um just be with that group of people that really wanted to make something happen so then um later on or later still during the time we were um just walking around just um I FaceTime one of my friends assured that I was on the highway I'm like yeah look I'm walking on the highway then people were starting to say that uh, the cops were gonna come and like put everybody in vans and stuff like that. I was like, oh crap, I don't wanna get arrested because I can't get arrested. My mom would be very angry at me. <laughs> and my roommate and I we were like, well, I guess it's just time for us to go. So um, we noticed a lot of people, were, or not everybody, but a lot of people stayed, but I just didn't want to get like in trouble because I was afraid of what could happen. So. Um, my roommate and I we left and we started to walk by with like a small group of people and it was it was a it was a good it was a good time it was it was definitely something I won't ever forget because it was just like very it just made me feel like this is important this is something I can be a part of and um and then also I had parked downtown and we were walking from like I-40 like near Popeyes and stuff so I'm like this is a far walk and my legs hurt Mm -hmm. So as we were walking, one of our friends, um, she was like at, what was it, um, the Mexican restaurant just on Westgate, and she saw us, and I was like, thank you, because I'm tired of walking, <laughs> so she was able to drive us back to my car downtown, um, and that was really nice, and yeah, that was the first protest I went to, and then um, all of a sudden, I didn't come up with a sign, because I didn't know if I was going to stay for long, but I didn't stay for eight hours, I wasn't even planning on that. So somebody gave me, gave me a sign that I hung up in my room and it says my future matters. Um, so yeah, that was first. So do you remember, it's kind of funny because you go downtown sort of not knowing what to expect, but you certainly didn't expect that you were gonna walk all the way to the highway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so um what do you feel as though you learned from that first experience? What did you get out of that? Um, that sometimes you just got to just use that fear to like propel yourself forward. Like I was very afraid of just like what could happen, but I was just like, this is more important than the fear I could face that could happen to me. This is, I'm doing this so future generations don't have to continue to like protest for our basic rights as Americans. Um, I definitely took like this is something that isn't like a one-time thing. It's not a moment. It's a movement. Like 
like that wasn't just one protest that's just a part of just something like one protest isn't going to solve everything it's just we have to continue and like keep on pushing and like not give up because when you give up it's like then it's all for nothing but you have to just keep on pushing and um just see where it takes you so let's talk a little bit about George Floyd and what happened. What was your response when you saw the footage? Did you see it on your phone? Were you at home looking at it? Did someone send it to you? And how did you respond to that? How did it make you feel? Uh, it made me feel very, very, just very angry. And like, I can't remember where I first saw it. I'm pretty sure I first saw it like on Twitter because um, I use Twitter a lot just to get a lot of news and stuff about what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so when I saw that video, I was just like, why is this happening? Like, he literally is complying, like, he's not hurting anyone, like, why can he just get off his neck? Like, it just made me really angry, like, and I don't get angry very often, but just the way the cop was just, like, looking down at him, like, he was lesser, just really made me just feel, like, very just angry, and then, like, previous the weeks um like in early may when we were um we, when we learned about like brianna taylor and stuff that really made me sad like that happened to her and then um learning about ahmed arbery also really was frustrating to me because like he was just running and then he got shot down and um that one just but the george floyd that one just really angered me because he was like asking for help he was saying i can't breathe but like that didn't matter so that really just made me want to like things need to change like that shouldn't be allowed like the police it just something has to change like it's just like the way they're doing things isn't right it's just in the scene right okay so have you attended other protests since that first one mm -hmm. yeah i've seen it quite a few i can't i've lost count i've attended a lot um I remember I attended like, cause like in that early period of when everything was going on, just in early June, I was attending the protests like almost every day, cause things would just pop up, or I would just literally just drive downtown to see what's happening, and there's something going on. I'm like, okay. So then um, I've attended a lot. I I first started going to was in Greensboro, and then um, I branched out also to Winston Salem, cause they're doing something called Occupy Winston Salem or Winston Salem NC, and then uh, I've been to one in Graham. Alamance County, that was a couple weeks ago. That was more like a like a unity thing, but we faced a lot of, because um, Graham is very um, racist and they have the monument up where this um, um, white outlaw was shot, uh, not, where he was lynched and there's a monument in space and um, they still have the monument up. And um, I, that's when I first encountered, like actually face to face with like a white supremacist and um, people that believe in like the Confederacy and stuff, so that was really, crazy and then um I've been to about one or two in Raleigh but not really a lot because when I go home I'm, I usually stay at home but I did go to this one that it was like on Juneteenth Juneteenth like they had something going on in downtown Raleigh so I just wanted to go and then like I know this people were marching and then also I was in Raleigh when um, when they started to take when people started to tear down the confederate monuments uh, like I remember the day before it happened, I was just down there and I took videos of it, and then literally the next day it wasn't it wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I've been I've been to quite a few. So let's talk a little bit more about the Graham protests. You said that you were in the vicinity of white supremacists, mm -hmm. uh, which is very different than the first one that you attended, and probably the other ones that you've attended. So tell us a little bit more about that. Why did you decide to? attend that and um describe what you saw okay. um i learned about it from facebook because uh, i started to follow like a lot of different organizations like just like the black lives matter group in greensboro but there isn't like a chapter but they're just people that post information then the elements alliance for justice and so I learned about it from there. Uh, it was going to go on Graham. So I'm like, okay, it was 30 minutes away, Burlington Graham. So I went there. Uh, I didn't also didn't go with any of my friends because they were all busy that, I think it was Saturday morning. So I heard like it was, because I heard before I was going that Graham, in Graham that protests had been like illegal technically because um, 
the mayor or whoever decided to just make it illegal. So a lot of people were getting arrested for protesting when in other places it's legal to protest. So I just wanted to just go down there and see what that was like. Um, and and then the night before the actual like March, uh, I saw that the mayor of Graham declared like a state of emergency where they blocked off like a radiance where no weapons were allowed, like protesters or anti-protesters could have any weapons. So with that, I was like, okay, it should be pretty safe, like if people can't have weapons or anything. So um, we, it was like, um, what was it? I think it was like a mile or two march from like Burlington into Graham, because like Burlington, you can protest in the Graham, that's where you couldn't. So it was like a, a pretty big deal, just everybody out there and we were able to cross into Graham, protesting on the streets. The streets were also blocked off, like the police escorted us all the way through. Um, it was just really powerful, just everybody chanting. Um, I kind of stayed in the back in the beginning because I didn't have anybody there, but as I was there, I just kind of met some people that I just started talking to. I was like, hey, and I came by myself, and they, some people also came by themselves. So I was really in the back. But then um, as we were getting closer, I just kind of like moved more to the, towards the front because I like being in the front because I, I, I like to be able to see things and like it was really hard to see in the back um so yeah it was just it was really it was really powerful because people were playing music we were singing dancing in the streets it was really awesome um then as we got closer like we got to like where the stage was and where the actual like setup was going to happen of just the um just like of the program um that's when i saw like the confederate flags and like the white supremacists, and I just pulled out my phone and I started to like record them because I've like I've never seen them like like that or just up close. So it was kind of just like really just I was just blown back because so I was just like wow, there's really people out here that just support this thing that only lasted not even that long, but people like will die by it. So that just doesn't make sense to me. So at first, people just started to be um like kind of like not clash in a sense because there was a barrier. But they were, everyone was just yelling at each other, and like protest, um, the protesters like us were yelling at them. And then the Confederates they were just yelling at us. So then like they also did like a lot of um, pro profanity, and like they did a lot of like not good gestures towards us. I'm just like, why? Like, do you know why we're out here? It's just like they just want to make noise, but then people like, well, just ignore them. Turn it back to we started to turn it back to them, but some people still just. Um, argue with them back and forth and stuff and then I also argued just a bit just to, like I don't know just I know it won't really do much because like they're just in that hate mindset so it was like no it's no point um, but there is a point but it's just like you just gotta ignore those people sometimes and keep on um, doing what you uh, gotta do um, so yeah I was very just nervous because I was just like wow they're these people out here just, just hate my skin and I don't know why and, like, and it was just a lot. But overall, the whole entire um, thing was really great. People they sang a lot of good music. Um, I got this shirt that I really like from the Alamance for Justice. Um, and then also they were like guarding the, the police were also guarding the like Confederate statue so people can't like try to like tear it down or anything. Um, it lasted for I think about four hours and it was just really just incredible to just be there and then when it ended um we all just started walking back walking back in groups um and then I remember this one point as we were walking this guy this white guy in his truck um he had a kid in the passenger he's kind of just like I don't know how he did it but like he had her pressed on the gas and just like all his exhaust came towards us and like he did it like multiple times like he was just doing it and doing it like spraying the exhaust tank or outlet at us and like I have asthma so that kind of just made me really upset because like that's not good for my lungs and then also he had the kid in the car and I'm just like well see this is why kids do the things they do because they see this and they think it's okay so that just really frustrates me that he's not setting a good example for his child because then his child's gonna grow up thinking this is okay to do the people that don't look like you and then just it continues. So yeah, that was really crazy. And I was just I was just kind of scared walking back from Grand Burlington because I thought like they could like Confederate people would just come out and like attack us or something. But 
a lot of them just kind of passed by and like like made mean looks at us and stuff like that but it wasn't too bad but yeah that was that was an experience and so were you afraid because you know if if someone comes along in a truck and you don't know what he's going to do how did you feel were you afraid um other emotions yeah i was i was mostly afraid um but still like i shouldn't do anything because like it's gonna probably not turn out too well um but yeah i was mainly mostly afraid just because like they just i just they just can just be scary and like i try not to be scared but like it was just still scary just like especially like when you're not in a big group and it's just like a couple of us walking back and just like we're outnumbered in a sense because when we were all together when we first got to where the um event was going to happen it was more of us than of them it was just like kind of like a small group but there are still um plenty of number but we had more people with just like when they were just leaving they kind of like not really followed us but they were just look at us and like do that type of stuff yeah so you've been attending protests have you attended any meetings or anything more formally um i was gonna start i was gonna go to one of the um occupy wn um with some salem events this friday because i haven't been able to is because i've also been going back to raleigh just back and forth to go see my family then be here but but i haven't attended a lot of formal meetings and stuff um but i'm gonna try and do those more often i know this friday they're gonna talk about like dismantling um just inequality in muslim sale and then also i went to this also in muslim sale like the first thing i went to was about um they're telling us about what happened to john Neville. um he was um he was incarcerated in the was in the Forsyth County Detention Center and he unfortunately died. So I went to learn about that and um, we, um, they talked a lot about what happened and we each had moments to just speak about how we feel and I got to spoke and that was like the first time I ever spoke at an event. So that was really um, cool just to share like what I thought about just what we can do to change things and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And that was a black man, right? That was um, that died, and yeah, there's currently, I think, an investigation going on with that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, what are you hoping will be accomplished by these protests and by the organizing? Um, I hope that they will treat black people fairly more than they do and um that they'll ban things that shouldn't be allowed like banning hog tying people like what happened to marcus smith in greensboro he was hog tied and he died so i hope they ban things like that i hope they like really like hold police people like officers accountable for their action because i feel like they just get to do anything and they get away with it but like if you were me or somebody else were to do that thing, they will be charged and arrested, but I just don't understand why there's that double standard to um, just with how police get to treat people and then they get away with it. Just like, I feel like they should be be able to face more consequences and like sh they should do away with the, I forgot what it's called, but where they have immunity or something. Can't remember the word, but where they have immunity to getting um, charged with things. Um, and just, uh, police to just think about what they're doing and like not just react and just like actually think and like actually like not try to because I, I know a lot of times it's like are and we escalate the problem but then there's a lot of time where actually people are cooperating but they still get like um rough handled and beaten up for even complying so i just wish that um they're being hot ties probably like also reform the police and like I know there's been a lot of talk about defunding reforming abolishing I think it's like we could do something of mixture of all three where we like kind of like have the police do like like um things that involve like murder and like robberies and stuff and then like have other departments where they can work with like people that are having like a mental health crisis or dismiss the best domestic abuse violence stuff like that where it's just like the police don't get to handle every single thing when social workers can do it or mental health professional professionals can do it 
um, just like just reorganizing just the way police and um, 911 is used for. Um, and then um, also like the, I know with the Breonna Taylor, they passed something with the, the no knock warrant. I think they're trying to do away with that. I feel like that would also be good because it's like you really, she just woke up the police just gunning her in her home while she was asleep. And I feel like that wasn't right. And they even had the wrong house. So that didn't make sense to me. And they're still not arrested for what they did. And I feel like they committed a crime and they should be held accountable for that. Okay, good. So um, on June 14th of this year, I met you painting a boarded up storefront on Elm Street. And mm -hmm. what inspired you to do that? And tell us a little bit more about that. I believe you called it um, Hands Up, Don't Shoot. Yeah. Um, so on, um, on the protests and like a lot of the stuff just started to get more like violent where people started to like loot businesses and stuff on um, board started to come up. So at first I was just very just like, why is this happening? Why are people doing this? Like, and then a lot of times people try to believe it that it's black people doing this, but then it's just like, why would we do this? And then um, we just really sad to see small businesses and stuff that I've seen just get destroyed and they all had to border up. So that was really sad to see. But then when I started to see um, local Greensboro artists paint and stuff. I was like, oh, this is actually really cool. So um, when on um, one Saturday or one day, I just went downtown and I walked all the way up and down the streets and I took pictures of all the art. But I was just really inspired by like what people did from something that was disruptive into something that was really beautiful. So, um, and then like, I have this one favorite artist, her name is Gina. Elizabeth Franco and like she's she's done a lot of cool murals around Greensboro so I saw the one she made of George Floyd and I really liked that one a lot it was really beautiful um so just seeing all the artwork I got inspired I was like well I want to paint something and then I was like well I'm not technically an artist like I I'm a college student majoring in kinesiology and that has nothing really to do with art but I'm like well I used to like I used to love doing art when I was a kid like growing up I used to like making art making like short stories and just being creative and just creating things. So I kind of tapped into that and I was like, well, what can I draw or paint? So then um, I went to this protest on, I forgot what day it was. It was in June. It was at a, it was at the rally where it's like the five black teens that had gotten stopped by Greensboro police or what was it? It was like, it was a pretty big event. It would happen in LaBauer Park. And I made this one sign that said, hands up, don't shoot. And, um, I kind of just like made it kind of quickly because I wanted to bring a sign and like hold it up and stuff. So I was like, I can do hands up, don't shoot. And I kind of just put in like really cool colors and designs that I usually like doing when I um, draw letters. And then um, while I was there, somebody came up to me like, oh, that's a really cool sign. And they, could, they took a picture of it. So I was like, oh, well, I was like, well, I could just make my sign, but in a bigger form. So then I um, went to Michael's, I bought some paint. I didn't buy enough paint because I really thought I'm a, you just need like only four tubes and I'll be fine. I was wrong. I needed a lot of paint. Um, so then I kind of looked around where I could see like a blank boards that weren't being used um, that didn't have any art on it. Nobody claimed it. So then I just started painting and um, people would just come up to me like, oh, that's going to look really nice. And like, oh, that's going to turn out really good. Or like, what are you painting? I'm like, let's say hands up, don't shoot. And they're like, oh, that's really good. So then um, the owners of the shop um, or one of them came out and was like, oh, are you painting for us? I was like, yeah. And they're like, we've been wanting, been waiting for somebody to paint for us. I'm like, oh, cool. Cause I didn't know if they're going to be like, actually, you can't be doing that or something. I was just like, let's just see how it goes. So um, I started and then like in the beginning, I really didn't know how I wanted it to look like cause um, I've never made like a public piece of art before. So this one art teacher came up to me and she gave me like a lot of good advice. And she also gave me some paintbrushes and she helped me also with the idea of making hands. Cause at first I just wanted to put hands up, don't shoot. Um, and then she was like, well, you can put hands on the side and then you can paint them in red. I was like, oh, that's a good idea. So then she um, she helped draw, um, outline the hands for me. And that was really nice. Um, so then uh, it took me in total about six days to complete. And as I was painting, people would just come up to me and like talk to me like how you did. And I was explaining like what I'm doing. People would also come up and like take photos of me and then they would share share with me. So 
um, I'm glad people were able to just have that for me because it was like, oh, I really did that. That really like inspired a lot of people. And then um, people would also come up and interview me um, and stuff like that. So that was really awesome because I was like, I just wanted to do this because like I, I just got inspired by what everybody else was doing. So I'm like, oh, I want to do it too. And I was like, I'm bored. So why not? Um, so then um, I was able to finish and I was really proud. It made me really happy to see that it was done because it took a while. It took a long time, longer than I thought. I thought it was going to be done in like two days, but that wasn't the case. Um, and then also people would say like, they haven't seen anything that says hands up, don't shoot. And I was like, okay, cool. Like this is something that nobody else has done. And then also I'd um, messaged Gina Elizabeth Franco on Instagram and I told her about my mural and um, if she could like check it out for me. And she did and she came and like she said it looked really good and really good and that made me happy because um, she's a really cool artist and like it made me proud that she liked my work too. Um, so yeah, that was, it was, yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad I made it because when I, as I would work on it, people would just yell out from across the street, hands up, don't shoot or I would see like kids admire it and that made me happy because I just want them to know and like want people, everybody to see like when your hands are up, you don't have to shoot because you're complying. Yeah. Well, thank you. I was glad that I was able to run into you. You had not completed it at that time, but um, which was good. Um, I wanted to get photos of it in process. So if you have some, some photos of the final Mm -hmm. um, product before it was taken down then please share those with us for the collection okay um, I know that you mentioned to me by email that it is going to be on display at the local museum the Greensboro Museum yes um, so how did you find out about that um so when I finished um, it was up for a while, for a couple of days, and then I had went home to Raleigh to go visit my family, and then when I came back, I saw that it was taken down, so I was like, oh, well, where did it go? So um, before I had finished it, the owner of the shop, they gave me their email so I can contact them to let them know like, when I was going to be done with it. So they emailed me and told me that they um, had it, that the Greensboro History Museum was going to pick it up because they're collecting the art. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Then um, I went to where their shop was, but they actually moved, it was like old photo specialists. So they had it and then they asked if I could come and pick it up or if they wanted to give it directly to the his museum. So at first I said they could, but um, I came and they, I didn't have a truck, so I didn't know how, to, how I could transport it. So um, I grabbed a couple of my friends and uh, we went to the um, business and they had it like in their back and it was, majority of the majority of it was still intact like it didn't like really break so I was really happy to see like it didn't really get damaged when they were taking it down um but like some of the white parts were off so um I was like oh that's fine at least it's still like it's basically like it was in two big pieces so we have loaded it onto their truck it was like they're an old couple so they needed help um lifting it and stuff so we were able to put it in their truck and then um, the owner of the shop, one of the owners, he followed me to my house and then um, my friends and I, we dropped it off like around my porch because I uh, have a porch and then um, that's where it was for a while. So then, um, that's when I contacted the Greensboro Museum. I was like, hey, um, I have this mural. I heard you guys were going to collect it and um, um, let me know when y'all can pick it up. So then they reached out back to me and they told me, yeah, we can take it. We um, heard about your mural and stuff. So um, you're like, yeah, we can send two people out to come and like get your information and sign some stuff and then we'll um, take it. So it came a couple of days later. It was like, I think it was a Wednesday afternoon. Um, so then, um, and also before they came, I was like, well, I wanted to look as complete as I did before. So I still had my leftover paint. So then I just started to um, paint the parts where it got like chipped away or where the white bars weren't anymore. So I was able to um, make it look a little bit cleaner because I'm a perfectionist. I like to make it look perfect. <laughs> so um, I finished, so they had came and um, they, I signed a lot of stuff. Um, they interviewed me and asked me like, you know, uh, who I was, where I go to school, um, what I'm majoring in and like why I decided to do this. And I told them and they were, um, say that it looks really good. I was like, thanks. And also I told them like what in, like who is where I mean, like I told them all the artists and then I don't know, it was, um, I got, I decided to make my mural based off of my protest sign, and then 
I showed them that sign, so they also currently have to sign. So um, then they, um, I signed all the stuff, and then they came and collected it. And this one dude that was with him, he was like an intern for the Greensboro History Museum, and I recognized him from the gym because um, since I work at a gym, I can recognize like, a lot of faces that I see off campus. So I was like, hey, I seen you at Kaplan and stuff. So we had a little conversation and stuff. So um, we were able to get my contact and my Instagram. And then also I had made like um, like a, um, on my Instagram, I had like a little story that I say of just like my progress through painting. So it's just like I took snapshots or snaps every day of it. And so I kind of show that to them as it progressed and stuff. Um, um, so it was off my hands. I was like, yay, finally, because I was like, I just want them to have this because like I have no space for it. And I'd rather just it be shown to like people to see and see and just like learn about it in the future and stuff. So then um, the dude, Chris, he um, DM'd me on Instagram a couple weeks ago, and he told me that, um, hey, you're, I just saw your mural up in the museum, and that looks really nice, but currently the museum is still not open to the public because of um, the current state guidelines and stuff. So, and y'all said he couldn't send me a picture of it because he didn't know what the rules were, but I was like, okay, that's totally fun. I was just happy to hear that it was like up and in the museum and that I was like, wow, that's really cool. So yeah, that's how it had, that's how it ended up in the museum. Okay, good. So were you able to talk with any of the other artists on Elm Street? Um, yeah, I remember as I was, as I started painting, I was also painting alongside, um, her artist name is Jay Squid. She was the one that made like this really cool one that said, I think it said protect black women. It was like in front of a hair, hair um, salon and it had like, it was a pink background and it had like, Present a big rose in this green and white. Um, so um, I talked with her as she was painting because um, she's like she's like an actual artist and she does that for like a living and stuff. And she was spray painting, so I actually like you know what she was doing. She asked what I was doing, so it was really cool just like working alongside her. And then um, as I also as I took pictures of like everybody's artwork, I followed a lot of those people on Instagram. So then a lot of them followed me back. So. Um, when I had reached out to Gina, she had said that she could, like, if I needed, like, help taking it down or if I needed more art supplies, she said she could, like, give me some. I was like, thanks. Um, so just, like, I was able, I just shared a lot of their work, and I, like, commend them on what they did, and they commend me, too. So it's just been, like, so I've met a lot. I met a lot of people during the time I was painting. Like, I met just a lot of artists and a lot of people just that live in Greensboro or just, like, or live downtown, and that was really cool. Mm -hmm. So why did you um, choose specifically the hands up, don't shoot? Um, that's a little bit before that's, you know, people were chanting that earlier in the movement when you were quite young. So <laughs> you were much younger. So uh, why that image and how did, do you even recall how you became acquainted with that chant and the, the story? surrounding that yeah just yeah especially just growing up since i think what the first black life the movement started back when trayvon martin was um shot back in i think 2012 so i was in say 21 i was like 13 i think so i barely remember but i just remember like just um since then a lot of the protests that i would see on tv because i i didn't attend like an actual black Lives matter protest until 21 so a lot of that I would see people chant like hands up, don't shoot. And then also I just learned about a lot of black unarmed people that were, they had their hands up and the, the police was shot at them. So that just didn't make sense to me. Like, why would you shoot somebody if their hands are up? Like you can see they have no weapon. Um, then also just, and also in movies that um, talk about um, just the Black Lives Matter stuff, they always talk about hands up, don't shoot. And so that just been really just ingrained in me. Like, if your hands are up, you shouldn't be shooting at somebody. Um, so I was like, I know this isn't like what happened to George Floyd, but I feel like it's still important for people to know and to see that when your hands are up, you shouldn't be shooting at someone. And I feel like, because since I'm a visual person, I feel like if this, if you see it visually, it's ingrained in you. So hopefully you'll remember that. Re remember that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the movement has been with you really from a sort of age of awareness, 12, 13, 14 mm -hmm. is um, 
you know, a time in which children begin to really begin to process what's going on around them. So you remember some of those earlier um, protests, mm -hmm. it's like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially the with Trayvon Martin, and then also I remember the, with Ferguson, mm -hmm. Michael Brown, and all that. I was like, even though I couldn't attend a lot of it, I was just like, well, what can I do? Like, I feel like I can't really do a lot, but um, yeah, just seeing that, just like on the TV, especially like just seeing how they treated protests, like when they would tear gas them, and especially now with the rubber bullets. I didn't even know that was a thing until uh, um, with the George Floyd protests and stuff, but people getting shot at with rubber bullets, I was just like, well, why are they using rubber bullets against protesters if they're not armed? Like, it just didn't make sense to me. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Did your parents ever find out about some of your activities? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because, um, I don't know, she, my mom just, she assumed that I would, even though I was like, yeah, I know, because, like, that protest I went to, um, after it ended, I was in my car and I was driving my roommate and I back home. So then my mom called me. I was like, oh, great. So then um, I was like, um, I took it. I'm like, I'm driving. I'm, uh, I'm driving with my roommate. So then um, after it, we went to Chipotle and I bought some Chipotle and I went back to our house because I, I live off campus in a rental house. Um, so then I just took a picture of my Chipotle in front of the TV and I text, texted it to my mom. I was like, see, look, I'm home. And it, <laughs> Because I was like, yeah, the protest got canceled. Like the one I was gonna go to got canceled, but I didn't feel about the other one I was going to. Um, but then also, I, I have an older brother. Um, he's like he's 33 and he lives in Austin, Texas. So um, he figured that I was be going because like I remember one day my mom texted us in our family group chat and she like called out my brother and I because she, she knows that we would be the ones to go to protests and stuff. And she was like. Um, make sure y'all don't go into any, look how they're treating all that stuff, but um, just like that, and so my mom did find out eventually, but like, I think she's kind of cool with it, because I try to be safe, and then a lot of these, like, I went to this one protest that happened in Winston-Salem, where we just kind of occupied Harris Theater, and um, we just sat there, and we um, chanted a bit, and we were socially distanced and stuff, and so a lot of times I would find like photos that people took of me as I was there. So I'm like, well, she's going to find out eventually if she sees these photos. So I kind of just went ahead. Like I have the first one I have is one that says my future matters. And it's a really cool looking photo. Um, when I was walking downtown a couple of days after the event, this one photographer stopped me. I was like, hey, and he's like, hey. And he's like, he's like, I know your face. I'm like, oh, okay. He was like, I see you. I'm like, where? And then he pulled out his Facebook and it was, it was me uh, that he had took of me and said that I was just looking like dead at him because I I remember I would just stop and like just stare at people or just hold my son and look at cars and like have people see me and um, he took it and that was really cool and then um, this one photographer Allison she's been to a lot of the ones in Winston Salem so there's this one of me as we're like on the floor sitting at Harris Theater and I showed that to my mom because I thought she would think that's cool so yeah, I know she still doesn't like like me going. I have been going to a lot um, more recently now since like school's starting back up. Um, so yeah, just like also just with my brother, um, it's also nice to have him also be a part of it because I look up to him a lot. But then also I get scared about what could happen to him because he's a black man and people might think he looks threatening and stuff. And especially in Austin, Texas, because there's been a lot. It's a lot bigger. Of, of a movement than like compared to like in Greensboro and stuff but um just like so yeah so do you plan to continue to do social justice work it doesn't necessarily have to be through the protest but I, I don't know if it maybe ties into what you plan to do with, with your kinesiology degree but what are your future plans um yeah I, I do want to continue with um being like a being for social justice and being an activist, because I feel like you don't really need a degree to do that. I just feel like, because a lot of people say like, you're an activist, look what you're doing. Like, I feel like I'm just doing what we all should be doing as people, as when we see something that's wrong, we are, we should call it out and like protest and make it change for something that is good for us all. So I definitely see myself still being like a part of like the movement. And then with my um, degree in kinesiology, I know as a physical therapist, um, I can like be an activist in that sense of just like making sure that people can get 
like the treatment that they need, especially like, I think um, when I'm older, I do want to open up my own PT clinic and hopefully treat those who have like, don't have insurance, like a free PT clinic type thing where you don't have insurance, you can come in and you can get a free PT or a free PT or if you have like uh, insurance, but you don't want to pay a lot, you can pay it for like a discounted price or something. Just like where, um, cause there's a lot of, um, I know there's a lot, cause I've um, had a couple of internships in the PT field so I, I learned a lot from them of like what's going on in like in their type of world where they have to like try to get laws passed or um try to get things because there's a lot of conflict between like PTs and chiropractors like they hate each other and stuff so the chiropractors are always trying to get at PTs for something that they do and they so it's just a lot so just like um trying to be a part of that more and see like um what I can do with that too. Okay. Right. Is there anything that you want to add that you feel as though you want people to know? Um, let's see. That I'm a pretty cool person, and um, I like to get involved in things when I see it. Like, I don't want to just wait, and, like, I feel like I have to be out there just so, um, just people that, people should know that this is important to me and that um, I won't stop until like things change and yeah. Great. So I'm going to stop record.